Hello, I'm Steve Culpin, Senior Architect at TransUnion on the Enterprise Logging and Analytics team. And I'm Don Riley, uh, Senior Manager, Enterprise Logging and Analytics, also at TransUnion, also a CCOE admin. All right, and today we are going to talk about routing data around the world with Cribblestream. Okay, let's take a look at the problem statement now. We operate in over 30 countries around the world, very geographically dispersed. I think we have companies on every single continent uh, on the planet at this point. And some of those are also in the developing world where access to the internet isn't equal to the, to the rest of the planet. And we do have quite a bit of bandwidth concerns. So this has led to us having to put data lakes, we use Splunk particularly, in our various regions to capture the data locally. And we have a, a difficulty getting all that back to, to the central location at our corporate headquarters to see the various operational metrics that our, our global operations center wants to look at because we will have to deal with uh, limited bandwidth on WAN links or uh, just overall latency over the, over the distance of the internet, hardware cycle not being up to date on the on in between the different data centers. So, Steve, do you want to go over what we've done to solve this problem? Yeah, absolutely. So we can see here that users have to log in locally to each environment to really get a sense of how is the environment looking. So our solution to this is a single centralized view. So rather than users having to go into each environment and having to get an understanding, looking at dashboards and trying to interpret overall health, the user can now go to, all the users can go to a single environment, look at a single dashboard, which would represent their single pane of glass and be able to quantify health within looking at a health score from zero to 100. So all of this is going to be, all the data that's flowing is going to be standardized um, into a nice clean format. Some regions may have higher volume than others. Some may have higher response times than others. Um, everything's really going to vary and be different per region. So there's no standards. Everything, uh, they, they could also be using different hardware as well. So with that in mind, we built out some anomaly detection to help baseline uh, what the value should be. And then drive down that overall health score whenever things start deviating and push that into a dashboard. So now users have that really clean single point of view to, to get an understanding of the environment. And with that, we used Cribble Stream. We can see universal forwarders are still pushing data to Stream. Stream will act as a pass-through. So all of the data will go through to the local indexer still. Nothing will change there. But what we're doing is we're aggregating some of that data and we're pushing that aggregated data over the line to our corp environment. So really, we, we needed a, a single clean way to where we can provide a single pane of glass view and really provide that overall health uh, performance in just that one view. So Don, you actually have a pretty funny story about this. Do you want to talk about that? Yeah, we... um. We and this was doesn't even involve the uh, a developing country. This is, this involves uh, sending our data from the United Kingdom over. We found that the amount of data that we were sending back saturated the LAN um, and really impacted operations because we would get that back pressure and would cause significant amount of uh, logging issues, but also any other connectivity issues back to the US. So we had to find a, a different way of getting this data from our, our remote regions and and dealing with it, uh, you know, limited bandwidth issues. So what we decided to do is rather than sending everything over, over the network into that single environment, we decided we need to cook that data or we need to aggregate that data up. So if we look at the two images here, the first image is gonna show that aggregated data over is about a hundred. Yeah, it was a hundred events. The second one is going to show the raw events. So what we're saying here is aggregate that data up. So we're only sending four events over rather than a hundred events with all of this extra field that we don't necessarily care about. 
So that first image there, this is going to give us attributes around the data. So response time, volume, error counts, uh, error ratios, uh, median, max, average, all these different uh, attributes around certain metrics that we care about. We're rolling them up, cooking that, and pushing that data over the wire and pushing everything else, all of that raw data that we see in the second image, we're pushing that to the local indexer. So it's simply a pass-through through CrippleStream. And we're sending all this aggregated data out into our single environment to where we could then look at it in that single pane of glass view. So the size reduction now. So Don, we were pretty surprised at when we when we initially saw this. I think the that column in particular, full event length, that's pretty good, isn't it? Yeah, I, I mean, we knew that because we were throwing out a lot of unnecessary data um, and just distilling out what we really cared about, we were going to have reductions, but we weren't expecting this type of reduction down almost 98, 99%. I mean, pre pretty impressive, right? We're sending in 120. Over those 100 events that we sampled, which we have significantly more than that, that is just a tiny fraction of what we sampled. We see that 120 kilobytes in, 1.3 kilobytes out for just about that 99% reduction. Pretty good. So let's talk about how aggregation works now. So for those of you who use Splunk or really any other logging tool, same exact concept here in Stream. So if we look on the left-hand side, this is how we do it at search time within Splunk. So what we're doing first is we're binning our time based off 60 seconds or one minute. And then after we bin our time, we're then using that transformational command there, that stats command. And we're finding the max response time by time and status. So now if we go to the right-hand side, we see that uh, when we aggregate in stream, we see if you look at the very bottom where it says group by fields, right at the bottom of that image where you see group by field status. So same exact concept we're doing that we just showed in Splunk on the left-hand side. We're grouping by that status field and we're also grouping by time. So we have a 60 second time window and we're grabbing all of those aggregates there, all of those attributes around uh, what the metrics that we care about. So we have max, uh, max sec or that max response time that we see on the left-hand side. We have average, we have median, we have counts, we have sums. So we same exact way we would do it in Splunk at search time, we would do it in Cribble as well. Yeah, and so when we take a look at the, uh, the search relevance here, when you're, doing, when you're searching just the raw events, uh, you're going to have to pull back those results and then pick out the data out of the events that is relevant to you. And that, that's pulling a lot of extra data over the line that you don't necessarily need. Every single log I've ever seen always has some sort of extra formatting or fields that we just don't care about on a normal day-to-day -day basis. Whereas by doing this, we can send over and index the, rate, the relative data points that, that we would use on a day-to-day -day basis and you know, increasing that search relevancy will uh, pay off dividends, as we're going to show. As we uh, as we alluded to earlier, you know, one of the uh, solutions could definitely have been a federated distributed search where we search against the data at rest. But we found for this particular use case and for quite a few use cases, being able to collect that data in transit, aggregate what we need out of it, and then just push that relevant data to our indexing tier definitely provides quite a few benefits. There are cons as well. And I think when we take a look at the uh, the next couple slides here, we'll see the, the pros and cons of what whether this might be useful for you or if you might wanna find a different strategy. Indeed. So let's talk about pulling the data. So the pros behind pulling the data relatively easy to implement. So this would represent either federated search or peering to your indexers and running searches across that over the network. Um, and you're bringing all that data back. So because of that, you don't necessarily have to understand the format of the data up front. You just run a query and it will hit those search peers and return the data that it needs to return. And this is pretty good for ad hoc type searching, one-off type searching. So you don't necessarily really know what you want to look for, but you want to look for something. 
this may be a pretty good solution. But now looking at the cons, increased network load. So this you don't necessarily need this solution if uh, you're doing relatively small queries and you're not hitting too much. But as you begin to scale up, you're really going to be saturating the network with unnecessary searches or data moving over the network that doesn't necessarily have to happen. So think about doing this at scale. So how can I correctly do this at scale? So another con behind it, impossible to, uh, to, to achieve that search relevance. So that search relevance is really knowing what you want to look for and bringing back only what you care about. And lastly, we spoke about it prior, the unpredictable search runtimes. So if you have, say if we're operating, say hypothetically 100 different countries, each country has different, uh, uh, everything is completely different. There's no standard in, in a specific region. So things may return slower than other things. Some regions may have significantly more traffic than other regions. The, the only way you're gonna get a complete result set is when everything is done sending. This is this is gonna be completely dependent on network speed, on uh, how much volume is running through, and just how long it takes for your slowest servers to respond back. Now, moving on to pushing data, um, this is much better suited for recurrent searching, things like security alerts, uh, dashboard queries, things that you do on a daily basis, minute to minute, and you don't change the query. You have your uniform data structures because you're only putting in the data into these indexes that you need. And that will bring you to your 100% search relevancy. Because we've pushed the data to a more central location and all the data now is being fed from that central distilled index, we know that we can predict the run search times much better. So they're gonna be much more uniform and we're going to, because of the reduced data over the WAN, particularly the interconnect links, you're going to have much reduced data load. We saw, we're seeing 98 to 99% on, on the use cases that we're doing, but that's not without some trade-offs. This requires planning. It requires you to understand the data that you're using. It requires you to understand how you're going to implement it and where you're going to do these aggregations, where you're going to do the comparisons and plan it out through the pipeline. Also changes to your, uh, to your data set won't go back retroactively. We're doing this live on the wire. So if you decide that you need to add a field, uh, to what you're searching, you're only going to get from that point forward. I'm going to put a big asterisk around this last point here, but doing it the way that we've presented it so far, there will be a slight increase of ingest and storage because we're taking the data points out of the local clusters on the line and sending that 1% of the data that we care about to our corporate uh, site. So we do have to pay for the storage and the ingest of that extra 1%. But we have plans on that, and we'll talk about that in a future slide here. Looking at the worker nodes now, they, they're, they're going to have their independence. And what I mean by their independence is they don't necessarily know about each other. So if we look at the, the problem here, we're aggregating on one of many nodes per region that make up a work group. So a lot of our worker groups have four or more nodes in them. So if we think about uh, if we think about this right in the aggregation aspect, if we want to find an average on if we want to find an average of some attribute, say response time, we're going to get four different averages for each worker node in the group. The, the problem that we currently have is how can we overcome that and find a single average across the group, not necessarily having to find an average of an average. So the, the solution behind that was to use a second layer of aggregation, i.e. a Splunk scheduled search, to further aggregate that data from each node. And so we still had that average of an average problem though, right? So if we have an average from each node here and we do that second layer of aggregation and we find the average of those four averages, we're not really gonna get an accurate result. And so then Don said, hey, you know what? We, how about if we, we do this, we think about this a little differently. Don, do you want to elaborate on that? 
Yeah, and so this comes down to just understanding your data, and this is the planning that we had to put into the pipelines. And so instead of doing the full aggregation on each worker node, we would actually send the sum of all the numbers plus the number of items in the set and then allow Splunk or Elk or whatever we send downline to do the, the final aggregation to give us a decent mean for our data set. Yeah, it's a simple solution to a complex problem. Just do a little math on this second layer of aggregation here. If we, if we think about that average formula, all it is is the sum divided by the count. So if we're pushing the sum and the count, we can figure out the average overall in the second tier of aggregation. And if we look at the end result here, that single pane of glass view that I was referencing earlier in the slides, this is how it looks. We have a single pane of glass for all of our operators to look at on a single search head node. And this allows them to look at health per region. So we have many regions here listed out. Each region is going to have different volume, different response time. Everything's going to be completely different. And the way we've built this out was a really uh, cool way that look, that baselines all of this information, puts, uh, puts it through anomaly detection, then picks out outliers, and that will essentially adjust the score up and down. So everything's hundreds across the boards, which is really good for all of our regions here. That means everything's good. So if we wanted to, to understand how the health is looking, say in one of our remote regions, all we have to do is come to this dashboard and have that knowledge rather than having to interpret it by logging into that region locally and looking at dashboards and trying to figure out how, how does this look relative to how it looked yesterday. So a little simpler, a little more straightforward and a lot of continuity for our operators. Yeah, so as we hinted about before, we do want to take a look at, at the future state and where we're going to be going from here. One of the things, especially with the uh, the Cribble suite that we can really start leveraging is instead of taking those insights and then indexing the raw data into a local Splunk index, we can actually take that raw data and do the, do the uh, aggregation, the distillation of the insights that we need, send them to the to our corporate indexers and then dump the raw into much cheaper S3 storage or GCP buckets and have those full logs for down the line if there needs to be a compliance audit or a uh, security incident response. The, these can be pulled back out and re-ingested the amount of data that we need for that particular situation, which is going to lead to significantly reduced license costs, fast search time query speeds, lower storage costs. If we do need to pull it back out, there is going to be a little bit of extra time, or if we need to search through Cribble uh, search through the data, it might take a little bit longer than doing it through the indexers, but these type of ad hoc searches are done pretty rarely. And so the, the performance isn't necessarily as important at that particular time. Yeah. I, I really love the concept here too, is ingest the insights and store the raw. So we do have the ability to rehydrate back in the Splunk or just leave it and then search it across that data at rest. And if we think about the insights, insights in our case are going to be uh, metrics that drive dashboards, uh, reports, alerts, uh, Rather than sending that raw data, than doing search time aggregations, we're sending insights over. We're sending aggregated data over. That's gonna do a lot. It's gonna power a lot of these uh, knowledge objects that live on the search head. And if we do have to query that data again, we either leave it at rest and we use Cribble Search to query that data at rest, or we rehydrate right back into Splunk and then use a tool everybody's familiar with to query that. And so. As we can see, going back to that pushing data, that slight increase in ingest of storage from the old model moves right over in the new model to being a massive decrease of storage and licensing. This is gonna be a huge money saver um, as well as a lot less administrative overhead trying to keep these, these servers that host this storage healthy. We can move that off to a third party and put that in the cloud. 
Yeah, and I think this speaks volumes to the the way we treat data. So we can't treat all data the same, uh, which is high value. Some data may be infrequently accessed. Some data may already have been used, and the value of that data is very low. So rather than putting that on fast, expensive storage, we can move that to slow storage, cheap storage, and it's highly unlikely that data will ever be used again, but we still have to store it uh, for compliance or security reasons. So moving that data to a, a super cheap storage tier is really going to be the key here to driving down those prices or overall cost. So here's some resources here. Um, we, we spoke today about aggregating data. Uh, we also spoke about Cribble Search. And lastly, that future state that Don was talking about, that observability data lake in our future state. Here's some additional uh, reading material that'll help uh, elaborate more on the topics that we spoke about today. And with that, we're going to go ahead and conclude this session. We really appreciate everybody taking the time to listen to us talk. Thank you very much.